If you look around, it is. You may be seated this morning. Praise the Lord. Good morning, good morning. Well, what beautiful weather the Lord has afforded us, at least for a few days. Those of you who love the cold, it'll be here what, tomorrow, today, sometime. Hold on, it'll be warm again a day or two after that. <laughs> Nothing like Houston, is there? We're in a series of messages called From Coward to Courageous. And moving in that direction, uh, we're in about the third, fourth sermon. I lost count here at this point in time. But it has to do with the character of Gideon. And out of this man's life, we uh, get a, a lot of glimpse into perhaps our own lives on a lot of different levels. But at the same time, how we can really move to toward a place in our own walk, in our own life of being a courageous individual. And too many times I think we misunderstand what that really means. But I want to talk about that today. And as I get into this message, we're going to be ending up chapter 6 and getting into chapter 7. I told Kathy this morning, I said, what I just preached this morning as we left the other campuses, that was four sermons in the last series we did. Uh, I, I preached on this 15 years ago on Wednesday nights, I believe it was. And it was that, that, so we're going to compress a lot. So you can take this home, read it, and you'll see a lot more in it what we'll obviously discuss. But there is one little incident I don't want to just jump over and go by. And just to give you a little word on it, because there's this popular thing it seems to be, and at least I've heard of it most of my Christian life, where people want to put out a fleece before the Lord. You heard this terminology? I'm going to put out, and it comes from this passage from Gideon's life in Judges chapter 6, starting with verse 36. <clears throat> Gideon said to God, If you will deliver Israel through me as thou hast spoken, behold, I'll put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. And if there's dew on the fleece only, and it's dry all, all around the ground, then I will know that thou, that I'll put a fleece, I'll read right in a minute. If there's dew on the fleece only, and it's dry on all the ground, then I will know that thou will deliver Israel through me as thou hast spoken. And it was so that when he arose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he drained, lost my place one more time, we're having a lot of fun this morning. He drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said to God, do not let your anger burn against me that I might speak once more. Please let me take a, make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece and let the dew be on all the ground. And God did so that night for it was dry on the fleece and dew was on all the ground. Now, a lot of people use this and they take this passage and I've had a lot of people ask me about this even. If I want to know the will of God for something and find the will of God for something, you know, if I should marry this person or if I should go take that job, whatever, can I put a fleece out, so to say? Uh, let, me, let me just clarify what this is all about. Gideon is not seeking to determine if it's the will of God for him to go face the Midianites. Gideon just wants to make sure that he's going to be a victor when he does go do what God wants him to do. And this is all about will I succeed is what this whole thing is about. It's not about is this the will of God. And there's a lot of people I, I really don't think that understand that context. There, there's nowhere in, in scripture does, does the word of God oblige God to, to uh, give us some kind of sign that what we're about to do is his will. There's this thing between you and your heavenly father. He literally is your father in heaven. And the Bible makes it clear on many, many occasions that God will and has the ability to make his will known to you. That you don't need some exterior sign to prove if something is his will or not. You're going to know. All right, so this is not about, is this the will of God? This is about, am I going to succeed in what you're telling me to do? And, and again, I, I do believe it's kind of a, a, a flimsy thing about some unbelief that rests in Gideon's heart some fear that's still abiding there. But this is Gideon's problem a long way through this, even as we deal with it today. I mean, he's already seen a lot take place. But, you know, don't rely on Gideon's example as a way of seeking guidance from the Lord in your life about putting a fleece out on, on some particular level because that's not what this is, this is about at all. So, you know, the, our proper response is the one that Isaiah made when he said, Lord, when he, God told him as well, here my sin me. That's exactly what Gideon should have done at this point. But God's being patient with Gideon where he's at at this particular point in his faith. Remember, we talked about his conversion really probably just now happening at this point in his life at this point. So he is young in this regard. But our attitude ought to be with that, whatever the Lord shows me, that's what I will do. I think it's the same with the disciples when Jesus said, come and follow me. And in, in, Matthew, in Mark 1.18 it says, 
and immediately they laid down their nets and they followed him. So in regard to the will of God, I believe God will show. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they know it. So God gives us his word. God gives us internal Holy Spirit abiding in us. God has a way of confirming what we're hearing in our heart with the word of God. You know, so in seeking the will of God, it, it doesn't get down to this putting out fleeces and signs and wonders thing. We just need to believe God. God had already shown Gideon his will for, for his life, what Gideon was supposed to do. He told him in, in, in chapter 6, verse 14, and you look through verse 16, he told him in verse 36. So, you know, this request only makes Gideon's weakness a little bit more evident in his spirit that he's dealing with. So the proper response is in this regard. But I, I want to move forward and look how God deals with Gideon at this point and speaks to his heart. Remember, the Lord has shown up to him as he's hiding out for fear, as is all the nation of Israel. They're hiding for fear. And he's hiding in the wine press, trying to thrash out some wheat for a living, for food, for his family. And the Lord comes and speaks to him and says, Oh, mighty man of valor. And of course, this probably seems a little bit intimidating or like maybe even that the, the angel of the Lord is taunting him or mocking him in some regard. I, I'm not sure. We don't have a lot of insight at this point exactly where Gideon is. We know his father is the head of this particular area, you know, of, the, uh, 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 of, of his tribe that he's in. And he is really a... He's, a prince, of, uh, so to say, of his father, Joash, who's over this particular region of the tribe of Israel. And perhaps he has been trained as a warrior. Perhaps he's been prepared. We don't know. Probably has been. But for the last 40 years, there's been no wars. And now there's seven years of chaos. And here he is, you know, farming. Well, everybody's being robbed and pillaged. You know, and the land's being destroyed. So he's frustrated, obviously, but he's still filled, filled with this, this unbelief and this fear as the Lord deals with him. You see it. His first response is that of his gasperation. Oh, if the Lord's with us, then why? And why in God, why, why, where, where is miracles? And why are all these things happening to us? And we talked about that, how God had already proved his presence. He proved his presence by one, by sending chastening. Many times we don't see the chastening of God. It's a good thing for us, all right? God dealt with him in discipline, dealt with the nation of Israel. They'd sinned against the Lord. The second thing God said in Judges 6, he sent a prophet. So he sent a preacher and a teacher of the Word of God to, hey, let's get it straight. God's dealing with you. And then he sends this angel. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, none of us has an excuse saying, well, where's the Lord? Open your eyes, you know? Open your eyes. He's, we just sang the song, I see the Lord. You know, His glory fills the temple. The whole earth is filled with His glory. But often we're so consumed with our, our own dilemma, our own problem. We just don't see God. We're too busy focusing on all the wrong things to see what God is up to. And so he begins to deal with Gideon now. And here comes what, what we'll deal with. This is what I'm gonna, I would call the principle of reduction, all right? And how God deals with us in this particular way. And Jeroboam, that's Gideon. And he's given that name because he's torn down the altar of Baal. And all the people who were with him, they rose early and they camped beside the spring of Harad. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands, lest Israel becomes boastful, saying, my own power has delivered me. Now, therefore... Proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. It was just 32,000, so here's what happened. 22,000 people returned. <laughs> 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, People are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them there for you there. Therefore it shall be that he of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But everyone whom I say, this one shall not really go, go with you, he'll not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, you shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. And now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth was 300 men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped and will give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the people go, each man to his home. 
Did I not flip the page with you? Y'all not keeping up with me back there? Each man shall go to his home. Now, remember, God has chosen Gideon to be the deliverer of the people. It's obvious what God's will at this point. And remember, we said that Gideon had what he needed. He had that promise from God. He had the very presence of God. He had the, the power of God because of God's promise and because of God's presence. He has everything he needs. Now God's getting ready to give him an army to command. So in this little portion, which we kind of call the principle of reduction, there, there, there are three things I want to catch this morning as we look at the, the message. One is the whole dispute with the Midianites and what that was about. The second part of this is the mission. The mission, what you might even call mission impossible, all right? Th there's a dilemma here. Remember, there's a large number of Midianites. The third element is how God deals with taking some men and, and deliverance and how he dealt with the men and out of that would come those deliverers, those ones who would be the ones responsible for carrying out the will of God and accomplishing the victory that the Lord had for them. Look first of all at the, the Midianites. Uh, remember, there's this dispute with the Midianites and there's 135,000 that have now crossed the river and come into the territory. Now, I don't know how much of a strategist you are, but you know, we're down to 32,000 versus 135,000. Now, what has happened? Here's the children of Israel. They're in the boundaries and the borders of their land. And now there's this territorial thing. There's this dispute that happens that those Midianites believe that the fruits of that land belong to them just by virtue that they can come get it. All right? Just because they can do it, they're going to come. Now, let's bring this back to reality. All right? We're not in Israel, and we're not facing the Midianites, and we're not Gideon. But yet there is another battle that raises every day around us that many times we're just not aware of. And it is a territorial battle. What Satan seeks to do, number one, is to keep us blinded and ignorant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want us to know God personally in our lives. And so he does everything he can to blind us from the truth of Jesus Christ. But for those who've come to Christ, this battle continues. Just because you give your life to the Lord doesn't mean that the battle's over. It just means now you can accomplish the victory because Jesus won the victory. But it's the same thing. It's still territorial. Satan is always seeking to invade my life through means of my family, my, my, my finances, my, my, any way he can. He just seeks to invade. It, it, and that's the way the Bible says Satan comes to steal and to kill and destroy. You don't steal something you own, right? So he's about stealing stuff that's not his. Who's he going to steal it from? You. He's going to steal it from me. Who's he wants to destroy? You. Always remember as a Christian, you are standing in a war zone. And until Jesus Christ comes and delivers us out of this world, we're always going to be in a war zone. And there's always going to be a spiritual battle. And there's always going to be those flaming, fiery darts of the wicked one. There's always going to be testing, there's always going to be traps, there's always going to be temptations that are always out before us. We need to learn to be on guard and be aware of what is really happening. So there is this, this spiritual parallel to what's going on. The, the word midyon, even in the name, it, in the Hebrew, that word literally means contention, quarrel, contest. And I, I want you to know that every one of us contest every day. Every one of us are in some kind of conflict every day on some level. Unfortunately, too many believers live their lives that way, always being defeated by that contesting, by that contention, by that quarreling. They never seem to rise up to, to, to face the enemy. I love the passage when Jesus says, this is my church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So there's going to be a conflict, and we need to realize there's going to be a conflict. Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So there's this contention. Now, there's two reasons usually. We, we know in Israel's situation that their first reason for the contention was they were in, it says they did evil in the sight of the Lord. God's children dis, misbehaving. God's children rebelling. And so God allows some things to happen to get their attention, to bring them to desperation. Unfortunately, if you and I are left to our own kind of life and say, just to live for Jesus by our own, you know, inclination and motivation, we're not going to do that. But God has come and sent his Holy Spirit to live in us. And he is always reminding and always teaching and always leading and always guiding, always protecting. All right. 
But if I fail in some point to move forward and say, I'm going to do what I want to do, instead of what God wants me to do, the contention begins and the quarrels begin. Sometimes we invite the enemy in to our lives by our disobedience. We open the door. And Satan, it, it doesn't matter. If he can just get an inch, he'll take an inch. Eventually, he'll get more if you give him that much. You open the door. Now, the second reason is there are times I believe that God just wants to teach us some, some truth and some, some lessons. God told Joshua, you know, I did not drive all the enemies in Canaan out before you because I want you to learn to do war, to make war. You need to learn how to, to enter into the spiritual battle. And there are things that God will allow in our lives to grow us, to direct us, to educate us spiritually, to, to transform our lives, that he'll use to sharpen our lives. So, but you have to understand that there is a war going on. The Midianites were 135,000 strong in this particular horde that comes into the land, and which brings us to the mission, all right? The mission is, as we said, it's, there's a dilemma. It is mission impossible. And I, and I can imagine that Gideon was completely perplexed when God said to him, uh, you have too many. You have too many. And Gideon's doing math. 135,000, 32,000. No, Lord, they have too many. <laughs> They've got too many. You don't need to reduce us. You need to reduce them. The problem's not here. The problem's there. God says, you know, you, you have too many. The, the, and, and if we're going to deal with this, if we're going to deal with this enemy, then we need to do it the right way. Now, you need to understand, again, let me make it clear. God's ways are not my ways. God's understanding is far greater and more infinite than my little puny mind can even begin to understand. Now, catch, we have the children of Israel, and it says that they're gathered at a place called Ein Sharad, all right? That, that literally is, is a, a Yin Sharad or something like that in the Hebrew. It means the well of trembling. And certainly descriptive of the children of Israel, and I probably would be too. I'm looking down the valley below. There's 135,000 Midianites, and I'm here, one of 32,000. Doesn't look good, does it? I don't have any better weapons than they have. Only thing better at this point is my position. They're down below. I'm up high. All right? There's just not a lot of opportunity here, and there's not a lot of advantage here. And it's certainly a great place. To, it literally means that word harad means to, to shudder with terror, to be afraid even to the point of quaking and trembling. Now, Gideon's situation here is very similar to the way a lot of people behave when they get in the midst of a dilemma in their own life. We're just afraid. We get filled with fear. How are we going to deal with this? There's no way. This is not going to work out. My marriage is falling apart. My kids are this. My, my job is this. On and on we go. And fear enters in and begins to demoralize us. It just robs us of courage. It, it discourages us. It, de it demoralizes as well as paralyzes. Proverbs 28 says in verse 28, that the wicked man flees when no man pursues. In other words, we can get, get consumed by fear. And fear begins to overtake our heart. And we have to, as believers, remember this. That when I begin to sense fear in my heart, that should be a warning sign. That is the very opposite of faith. It's the very opposite of belief. So I'm not believing God. I'm filled with fear instead of faith. So we have this conflict now that's going to happen. 135,000, 32,000, and then the Lord steps up and says, there are too many. He said, I'm not going to deliver Israel that way. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But let's get to the third part of this with the deliverance. There's two things I want you to see about the deliverance. The first thing, if, and this is where victory, we have to get this in our heart and mind. If we're going to have victory, the first element of this victory is, is, is we've got to get down to what's this really all about? What's the motivation behind it? The object of this deliverance is simply put the glory of God. Not the glory of Gideon, not the glory of Israel, but the glory of God. So God says, you know, they are too many. Psalms 115 says, not unto us, O Lord, and it repeats it, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. In other words, it's not about us, God, it's about will you be glorified. Now, if we'll be honest, many times we talk about the objective that I, I, I'm facing in regard to a conflict. My objective is really, you know, get out of it. <laughs> get through it, you know. And, and, and many times, oh, just do it for your glory. But really, we're not it's really like, get me out of this. You know, or, or give me some credit and you take the glory kind of thing. You know, but get me through this. And I, I think all too often when we're faced with these big 
kind of things in our life. We just missed the important part. God's ready to do something to give him glory in our life. God's getting ready to do something that will bring him honor. God's getting ready to do something that will be like worship for, to him and glory to him. He said, but there, there's, there's a problem here with Gideon and these 32,000 men from that objective of God being glorified, being fulfilled. Now, let me just re, restate it one more time before I go any further here. The objective is God being glorified in your life. Get that down here. And no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter where you're in your life, where you're in, with your parents, whether you're with your, your, your wife, your husband, the object here is that God be glorified. Where we are with the, as a church, where we are in our ministries, God would be glorified. Bottom line. And all too often, that's not even on our mind. It's like, oh, get me out of this, get me through this. I don't want to do that. I don't like this. I don't want this anymore. That's a problem. It's a big mountain. I can't do it. And we just miss it. But if we can get down to the object here of what the, where were this thing's really headed, man, it starts sorting out a lot of stuff real quick. It starts peeling away a lot of layers real quick. The, the opposition, the Lord says, to that kind of deliverance is what? It's the glory of man. Verse 2, he's, he, and he talk, he's dealing with pride. He, says, he said, they'll, they'll say that my own hand hath saved me. We can give a victory just like this, 32 versus 135,000, but then they'll start saying, hey, we did this. We were outnumbered. Incredibly. But we did this. No, you're still missing the mark. God did this. God was glorified in this. And so he says, the problem here is the glory of man. First Peter 1.24 says, For all flesh is like the grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls out. Galatians says, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, of making this about me, making this about you, getting all the attention for ourselves. I'm always amazed. You know, I listen to some, some sports radio during the day and off and on. And I'm always amazed to hear somebody, you know, that, that's, that, that's, that's no longer living in the glory days. It's the quarterback whose arm is gone, you know, whose mobility is gone. It's, a, it's the guy who, who caught all the passes, who can't outmaneuver the, 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 the defensive backs and the safeties anymore. The, the guy who's lost the step and the speed, you know, and he was, one time was the hero, and now he's just a zero. Yeah. How do you, you know, it's just, he, he might, if he succeeds, he might get a place in the broadcaster's booth, you know? But the glory days are, why? Because the glory of man is like grass. It's like a flower. It just fades away. It doesn't last. You may be on top today and on bottom, it's at 15 minutes of fame. But what about afterwards? That glory doesn't last. So we ought to put our, our, our investment into something that does last. And that's the glory of God. And do what we do for the glory of God. But I know that doesn't fit in the culture. We're living in the most man-oriented, humanistic culture that's ever existed. And when we deal with what we would call the principle of reduction, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to become less that he might become more. But that's where real life is going to be found. And so God starts working in the camp of Israel to get to them to the place where God can be glorified. And let me tell you this, once he's glorified, God brings grace and beauty and wonder and fullness to those who are glorifying him. So catch this. There's three categories that are in context of this, this deliverance that's going to take place, all right? And, and there's two directions. There's the glory of man and there's the glory of the flesh, all right? Now, the glory of God in Psalms 149 tells us very clearly, you know, that... Uh, that the Lord takes pleasure in his people and he will beautify the meek with salvation. If I, if I make sure it's him being glorified, he's going to beautify me with what? Deliverance is what that word is. Rescue. He's going to pull me out, pull me up. All right? So I, I want to glorify the Lord. If it's about me or the glory of man, that's where that all flesh is grass. It's going to fail. It's not going to last. It's not going to mean anything a year from now. It's going to be gone. Nobody's going to be asking for my autograph. All right? The glory of God abideth forever and forever. So we get down to the point where God says, all right, we're going to bring glory to God. The objective here is a glory that lasts. It's a deliverance that's strong and a deliverance sure. So he takes them down. He says, all right, we've got to deal with this. We're going to get them down to where I can be glorified. And he breaks into three groups. He deals with the cowardly, they go home, and then there's the careless, and then there's the courageous, all right? The courageous are that last 300. In fact, there's part of that larger crowd under careless that some of them might have been courageous but they were just too careless you know I've, I've 
been around a lot of people like that. We'll, we'll deal with that in just a moment. So let's start with the cowardly. I just, you know, just love this. He says, all right, go stand before the 32,000 get in and say this. If you're afraid, go home. Hello. Yeah. It's, we, we like to give the invitation for come. Here the invitation is go. Go away. If you're afraid, go on. You know, just, you're not going to accomplish anything. You're not going to accomplish anything in your life. You're not going to accomplish anything for the Lord. And so he says to those, he says, to the cowardly. And the majority of them were there. The majority were fearful, all right? 22,000 people dismissed. Now understand, before you get all haughty and arrogant, you're not in that 32,000 right now, are you? 32,000 have, have summoned, been summoned, and they, there was something, at least, that responded to the trumpet call we talked about last week, wasn't there? But when they got there, and they're standing up here, and they're looking down to the north, and they're looking in that valley below, there's 135 mounted warriors on camels. We don't even have a camel. <laughs> you know? That's pretty big odds, and there's a lot of guys sitting around. You can almost see them sitting around the fires talking. You know, I don't know how we're going to get through this. You know, you guys are idiots. They think we're going to come here and fight against 135,000 million. They're going to crush us. It's going to be. We're going to go ahead. My, my children aren't going to have a father. My wife's not going to have a husband. This deal's over, man. Ein Sherrod, the fearful. I'm almost surprised that Gideon didn't leave with this group. <laughs> Amen. I mean, there are, there's, there's lots of fears. We face them all the time, but it's what we do with those, all right? Will we, will, will we turn in faith or we walk in fear? Will people live with fears of all kinds, fear, fear of loss. You know, what if I lose my job? You know, what if I lose my money? What if I lose my house? What if I lose my wife? What if I lose my husband? You know, just, what about tomorrow? What's tomorrow going to bring? Economy looks bad. Things are difficult. I mean, the world's going nuts. And, and they choose to live in fear. And that fear really breaks down into just several things it, with the fearful. There's three main areas. One is the fear of man. The fear of man is, you know, is, is what so many people are, are manipulated by. Psalms 56, in God I will praise his word. In God I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. That's what we have to come to as believers. I'm not going to be afraid of what people think. The Bible says the fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. And so many Christians are really de demobilized and paralyzed in their life. They don't make a difference in the world they're in because they're afraid of what someone might think or say or do. And when you live like that, then you live in this same kind of, this well of fear that's, that's there. Psalms 118, 6 says, The Lord is for me. I will not fear what a man can do to me. For the Lord is for me. Therefore, I'm not afraid. There's the other element of that fear is fear of the devil. The word tells us never to fear the devil. Matthew 10, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. The only one who can harm my body might be the devil and it might be people, but hey, I don't have to fear them because God's bigger than they are. See, don't fear somebody who can just hurt you. They can't. They can't put you in hell. <laughs> you don't have to be afraid of. Paul wrote young Timothy, says, listen, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. I think we just need to remember, you know, in the context of this story, a good thing to remember, remember the children of Israel were up there at the well of fear, right? But I want you to, to know just for a moment where the Midianites are. It says they're camped to the north in a valley at a place called Moreh. Now, in, the, in this language, Moray has a kind of a quasi-technical sense in, in the Qumran phrase of Moraik, which has to do with a, tr a teacher of righteousness. And to put it in just kind of a common vernacular, the Midianites are camped out at the hill of instruction. In other words, they're getting ready to be taught a lesson about the righteousness of God. And it's not one of those lessons you want to learn. All right? Doesn't matter where I am, I'm in a whole lot better place than wherever their place is. Doesn't matter what you're going through, whatever you're having to deal with, you're in a better position. You've got a better place to be in. And then there's that last and most important fear. If you're going to have fear in your life, it's this word fear, and it's the fear of God. And this is that reverential trust. By the way, the word fear itself in, in, in the context of the Hebrew language is that word yara. 
And it really means more than trembling. It means, it means respect, reverence. In other words, if I fear God, that means I put my honor and reverence and respect for God above my respect for man. I put my honor and my respect for God above my respect for the devil. And when I choose to be fearful, it means that I am respecting them more than him. You, you understand that, the fear of God? A lot of people, they struggle with this concept of the fear of God. But if a man honors and reveres and respects and glorifies God more than these things, then he's going to find security and he's going to find safety and he's going to find fullness in his life. Psalms 2.11 says, Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. One who fears God takes his person, his Godhead, his holiness much more seriously than we do the world and their threats and the temptations. I think it leads to a desire to walk closer to God. It leads to a repulsion for sin. It's a kind of repulsion, anything that's not God. Now the instruction for the fearful is this in verse 3. Whoever's afraid and trembling, catch these two words, let him return and depart. Two words there. Two distinct words in the Hebrew language. Let him Return and let him depart. Return's an interesting word. In fact, it's translated return in many places, but there's about 11 occasions in the Old Testament where that particular word is translated backslide. <laughs> if you're fearful, go ahead and backslide. Just, just go, because that's what it's going to come down to. If you're going to operate in fear, you're just going to live as a backslider. Psalms, Proverbs says, and the backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways. That's not what we want. The other word is depart. And it really translates depart early. But the mindset is here, you know, you know, have you ever been at an event or something and say, oh, don't leave now, you're going to miss it. That's the mindset. You leave now, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss something. So the idea is, go ahead and backslide, you're going to miss it. You're just going to miss what's getting ready to happen. And something glorious is about to happen. So ultimately, by them leaving, they're going to miss something great. How often have we missed something that God was getting ready to do because it got fearful? It's, it's that the idea that, you know, it's darkest before the dawn, and it always is. You know, there may be some sorrow in the night, but joy comes in the morning. But will we hold out for morning? Will we hold out and stand our ground and stay tuned for what the Lord has coming? There is more to come. Those, you go home. The second crowd was the careless. The Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and, and, and I will test them there. And literally the word for testing is the word refine. It's that same word that God stands as a refiner and a purifier of silver, like it talks about in Malachi chapter 3. God says, I'm going to purify these, these 10,000 here. We're going to refine them. We're going to find out where the real gold is in this group. Because when, the, when, when we get down to it, the gold always rises to the, to, to the surface. The best is there. I will try them, saraf. I'll refine them there. I'll purge them there. And by the way, it's best to do that down at the water than out in the battle. And so they go down. And the idea is there's two groups here. It almost seems a little bit confusing, but the way it's written, but in the way it's translated that. But basically, the first group gets down on all fours and they lap like a dog. All right. This, they get down and there's the water. And I'm going to get down and I'm going to get down and get a drink of water like that. That's the, the second group is the one who takes and kneels. I've still got my weapon in my hand. And I bring the water to my mouth while I'm looking. It's the idea of vigilance. It's the idea of. He knows he's in bad territory. He knows there's something going on. You see, as we said a while ago, there may be some, some courageous people, but they're just careless. And the careless ones are the ones who kneel on all fours. And the courageous ones are recognized as those who bring the water up to their mouth and drink it from the palm of their hand. And by the way, even in the context of the Hebrew mind, it was the Baal worshipers who worshiped like this. That's not the kind of worshipers that God needs. Those who follow their desires, those who follow their own whims and wishes, those who are afraid of men and what others say and think or do. Those are the ones that need to be purged from the mix that's getting ready to go into the battle. I love this passage and we've preached on before in 1 Peter 5. It says, be of sober spirit and catch this, underline it, be on the alert. 
You have an adversary. The devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. You're not in the fight alone, so be vigilant. The word vigilant there is where we get the name Gregory from, Gregorian in the Hebrew language. And it's a combination of two words, Grego and Agoro. One means to wake up, and the other one means to have your faculties about you. So it's a kind of a two-faced, wake up, pay attention. Wake up and pay attention. That's the group that goes down to 300. They're not just occupied with, I'm thirsty, I need a drink of water. I got to get a drink of water. They realize there are other things going on at the same time. I can satisfy my thirst in a way that won't get me killed. I'm going to satisfy my thirst in a way that won't cost me in the long run. I'm going to do it righteously, and I'm going to be vigilant. It's the same word, this word Gregorio, that, that Jesus used when he was addressing Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, watch and pray lest you enter temptation. He wasn't saying, watch out for the Romans, they're coming, and they were. But he's talking about the spiritual battle that is raging at Gethsemane in that moment in time. Watch and pray that you don't enter temptation. He's talking about a spiritual conflict, is he not? Watch. Pay attention. It's, it's the same word the apostle uses when he says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. We have to be vigilant. Or we'll easily be assaulted and miss it. The last of this group is the courageous. And judges, when he said, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped. When you go down to the bottom of verse 8, those last part of that, that last compound sentence says, but he retained the 300 men and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. He retained the 300 men. Now, let's catch this. There's a victory getting ready to be accomplished here. And we'll talk about that more next Sunday. And the way that victory is accomplished, and, and there's some great parallels in scriptures for our life. But catch this. One is, it's the whole idea of victory is, is in the word salvation and deliverance, all right? Salvation, and we have to understand this, comes from the Lord. Your deliverance comes from the Lord. Your rescue will come from the Lord. Your answer will come from the Lord. Your understanding will come from the Lord. That's the source of everything. Psalm 98, sing unto the Lord a new song. He has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten the victory. Hallelujah. So it will come. But you cannot miss, you know, this second part in, in regard to it. Deliverance comes through him, but by us. So what do you mean? God brings deliverance to the nation of Israel, and he does it miraculously, supernaturally, but he does it by those men. He's chosen those 300 to do it with. It says, and the Lord... What did I hear those last words, that, that verse word? Retained them. The Lord retained him. Who did he retain? He didn't retain the cowardly. He didn't retain the careless. They always fall in the same old hole all the time, never paying attention. You know, they always wonder why they end up back in the same old place. Well, open your eyes and pay attention to where you are. Realize what's going on. Realize what the objective of your life is. Realize what the goals of the journey are all about. And you won't be so careless. First part of that is, if you have Jesus, you have what you need. Let me say it again. If you have Jesus, you have who you need, you have what you need. Let me put it this way. If you have Jesus, you have what you need. One more way. If you have Jesus, you have what you need. Now, if you don't get anything out of the sermon today, leave with that at least. I've got Jesus, I got what I need. I got Jesus, I got what I need. I, I, I got Jesus. I got what I need. But here's the thing about it. He wants to use you to accomplish it. He says he retains these. In other words, deliverance comes by the Lord, but it comes through us. Now, catch that first chronicle, because you probably already read it ahead of me, you know. Be of good cheer. And let us do what? Behave ourselves valiantly. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to behave ourselves badly for our people and for the cities of our God and let the Lord do that which is good in his sight. God's going to do his thing. I'm going to do my thing. But I'm going to do my thing according to his will. There's another great passage. You can just pencil this in. In, in uh, for, 2 Chronicles 27, 6, it's talking about Jotham who was used mightily by God. It says, Jotham became mighty. That's a good word, amen. Why? How? 
Here's the rest of the verse. I'm glad you asked. Because he prepared his way before the Lord is God. He was prepared. He was ready. I mean, when we enlist a soldier in an army, we just don't send him off the battle. He goes through training. He goes through whatever area of service it is, he's trained accordingly. Now, in the spiritual life, we need to have the same kind of mindset. I need to prepare myself. And again, I'm going to tell you the last things I've told you the last three or four Sundays in regard to this. It means I'm going to be disciplined in my life. I'll exercise self-control. I'm, I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to spend some time with God. I'm going to hear from God. I'm going to read His Word. I'm going to become familiar with His truth. All right? Why do I need to become familiar with His truth? Because the weapon Satan has is always a lie. Look how big the Midianites are. You say, that's not a lie. Yeah, it is, if you compare it with God. We're bigger than us, so is God. <laughs> so you prepare yourself with the truth. And as you do that, then you can, you can be like the Jotham. As you prepare your way before the Lord, then you'll see the mightiness of God resulting in your life and around your life. At 1 Chronicles 19, 13, just a great passage, you know. We'll do what we need to do. God's going to do what he's going to do but I need to do what I'm supposed to do. I can't sit idly on the sidelines and do little cheer, cheer, rah, rahs. Go Jesus. How do you get my heart right? And out of that, I believe, is that where it talks about Joseph became, became mighty. That's where the mightiness comes from. God does something in us and does something for us and does something with us. And he's constantly opening our eyes and preparing our hearts and courage flows. And it's not... It's not based now upon my ability. I mean, certainly the lesson from Gideon's situation here was the battle is the Lord's. God's going to handle this. And he's going to do it in a way where he'll get glory, where you'll understand that it has to be him. And you have to trust him. You have to believe him. So courage is not me being great. Courage is not my super personality, my alpha dog mentality. In fact, that's many times people with that mentality and mindset, the ones that have to be broken the most. And I have to live in brokenness. So God brings me to that place to reduce me. I've seen it happen in our lives. Every one of us, we will experience that in our life where there has to be reductions take place, where God just has to get us back to loving him, making sure that we're walking in the simplicity of Jesus Christ, living our lives for him. Sometimes it, it has to happen in financial ways, other ways. Hey, we as a church, we go through that. Up times, down times, middle times, medium times, you know, big times, small. It, it just, you, it's part of the cycle of growing in Christ. But that beautiful cycle, we keep coming back to the place to realize he's everything. He's everything. Everything I need, I have in Christ. So don't, don't have a misunderstanding when you're thinking about Gideon being this mighty warrior. He was, but you see what he was like. That's why I can relate to him. You sure, Lord? I'm doing okay. I'm doing, I'm doing good. <laughs> can we pray about it some more? How about if I put out a piece of wool? Throw some wool out there. You keep it dry or wet. Just go do what you know God's called you to do and see what God does in your behalf when you do it. You know, without courage, you never experience the, the greater things that God has for you in your life. And courage is really just simply your belief. I put my faith in Jesus. I'm trusting the Lord. I'm trusting the Lord in this trial, in this test, in this temptation, in this mission impossible that I may be facing in my life, I am trusting the Lord. And I start moving from that place of Ani Sharad, fear of trembling, the place of victory. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father,